So thanks and welcome to all of you. It's great to have such a big class. The word about Patrick Henry College is is getting out. Uh, you are going to get in your time here at Patrick Henry College a better education than if you went anyplace else. I think, well, how can he say that? Uh, that's a kind of absurd claim. I mean, maybe, you know, I'll learn a lot, but I could have gone to a lot of other colleges um, and also got a good education, and, and, and you could. But I, I really mean that you will get a better education here than you would just about any place else. And, and how can I say that? Well, we've got assessment data to, to prove it. Um, my, my wife gives is works in assessment, and in fact, you're going to meet her. I think on Friday she's going to give you all the the tests and things to see what you know and see all this, and you'll be compared. You'll do that again when you're graduating. So just take this as your first step towards graduation, and, and then we can compare and see how how our students are doing, and. Consistently, PHC students score at the top of all the other schools that take these tests. Not just really high, the top. And why is that? Well, I would say the main reason is our curriculum is very different from what you would get at a regular college. And our philosophy of education is very different than what you have. Uh, when you go back home for breaks, you'll talk to your friends or going to other schools, and you'll see, oh, we're really doing something different at, at PHC. And you'll notice that you seem to, to kind of be learning more than maybe they are. No offense to them. Why is that? Well, you need to understand what our approach to education is. I mean, one way to look at it is we, we, we describe our philosophy as a classical Christian liberal arts. That's our, that's our approach. Now, what does that mean? Most of education today is is dominated by the approach to education that's called progressive education. This is true in the public schools. It's true at the major universities. It's true even at most Christian colleges for all of their, their virtues. They tend to follow the assumptions of progressive education, whereas we follow what's called classical education. I'm going to explain what that is. Uh, you'll notice, for example, that when you talk to your friends, um, in, in progressive education at colleges, education is very fragmented. Okay, you, you might have a general education requirement, but you have a lot of choice. You know, you have to take, you know, one history class, and it may be, you know, the history of medieval Polish women. And that, that, that's a history course. Very folk, very specialized. Uh, whereas here, in our core curriculum, you take four history classes. You take uh, Western Civilization, one. Western Civilization, two. Uh, American history one, American history two. And you're studying the founders and you're studying the history of our nation. You're studying your, the, the heritage that you have uh, as an American and as a Christian. Okay. The, the, because of all the choices in the way most colleges do general education requirements, no two people have even taken the same courses. Because one person t wanted to study, you know, medieval Polish women, and another wanted to study, uh, uh, you know, something else. And you take some, some literature course, and it uh, doesn't matter what you take, and you have all of these dis choices. Here, everybody takes the same courses. This is a true core curriculum. It's a common core curriculum, which means everyone takes everything. We have 63 credits 
plus foreign language uh, in in our core curriculum, and everyone's taking the same thing. It doesn't matter if you're an SI major or lit major or journalism. Everyone's taking these courses that are tied together, that build on each other, that accumulate, okay, that that cultivate your your talents and your writing and your thinking in some very powerful ways, okay. okay that that's one difference. And then when you major in something at a regular college, then you're specializing, and it's fragmented. And you know a whole lot about that one area, but you don't know much about anything else when you come out of college. Whereas because of our liberal arts core curriculum, you know, we are preparing you for a profession, but it's on the foundation of a lot of other things that most college students these days don't even get to. Um, there are other differences. At a, at a regular college, you'll be taught that, um, well, progressive. If something's new, it's better than something that's old. Therefore, we're going to concentrate on you know new ideas, and and, and the old things that have gone that have been held for centuries are either minimized or ignored or are often just criticized and torn down because of the idea of progress. That's what I call progressive education. We're evolving and we're getting better and better and better, and the old is something we have to leave behind. Whereas here, in classical approach, we treasure the old, not just because it's old, but, but, but things that have stood the test of time. We believe that there's wisdom of the past. We believe that we have, a, again, a heritage as Americans, as, as, as Westerners, and as Christians that's a great counterweight to some of the confusions that our culture is going through right now. And that heritage, we believe, needs to be transmitted. It needs to be passed on to the next generation. Or it's going to be gone. And part of our cultural problems, I think, is because people have lost their heritage. But we're going to, to give it to you so you can build on it and so that you can pass it down to your, to your children. Um, a regular college under a progressive model tends to reject truth. Truth is relative. True, there is no truth. You create your own truth. Thinks it's right for you. You know what uh, Dr. Walker was saying too. But that's actually an educational method at a lot of universities. Chris, if there's no truth, what are you going to teach? What is there to learn? Why, why, why even be at college? But there, there, there are things you do. You learn you know, how to do things and you learn, you know, how to get a good job and things like that. But content is played down. Truth is played down. We believe there is truth. Uh, the, the classical education talks about truth and goodness and beauty. Those are the great ideals, the great absolutes of classical education. Uh, again, you'll be told that, that goodness is relative. There are no moral absolutes. There, there, there's nothing good except what's good for you, and that's what you choose. No, we believe there is goodness, and you can learn about it, and you can appreciate it. Um, you know, beauty is relative. That's that's the message that you'll get. It doesn't matter what you you read or what kind of music you listen to, or it's all just a matter of taste. And we'll just read for things that are fun. And well, classical education teaches that beauty is real. And that you can learn to open your, your, your hearts to it and be exposed and learn how to take in the great beauty of great works of art and literature and music. A regular college under progressive education rejects God. Or it might not reject God completely, but we, we have to leave God out of it. We'll leave at God out of consideration. Maybe if it's a Christian school, we'll have have religion classes. 
but your biology classes and your history classes and every other class so leave God out of it because we're following, you know, you have to follow a secular methodology. Well, we believe that we need to bring, bring God into all of these things. In fact, it's God who makes them coherent because he's the, the creator of everything. He's the source of it all. To leave him out is like studying a work of art as if there were no painter, <laughs> or, or read a, a, a book as if there were no author. And by leaving God into, and by bringing God in, and by being aware of God, how God fits into this subject, that's really the best way to learn it. Because it all of a sudden makes sense. And you also see how valuable it is, and why it's worth, worth studying. Now, classical education... Um, goes back t- through our founders, the founders of this country, had this kind of approach to education that, we're, that we follow. goes back through the Protestant Reformation. goes back to the early church. And, and it has its actual beginnings. A good way to understand it is to see its origins with the ancient Greeks and Romans. This is a word for, no better word for classical education is we talk about the, the, a liberal arts approach to education or a liberal education. You think, wait a minute, we're going to be, have a liberal education. We're conservatives. We're on a conservative education. It is conservative, but the reason that's called liberal in the history of education is that it comes from a Latin word libera, meaning freedom. And it goes back to the distinction they made back in the ancient Greeks and, and Ro- among the Greeks and Romans between an education for slaves versus the education for free citizens. And so the education for slaves was called servile education. And this was an education. The slaves, I mean, they had great accomplishments, but in many ways the Greeks and the Romans are very brutal societies. And their economy was based on slavery. But they needed the slaves to know how to do their work and contribute to the economy and, you know, make good things and know how to do it, know how to read and write. And, and, and because they did not want the slaves to think, much just think for themselves, they wanted the slaves to have an education that taught them to, to take orders and to not question the status quo, not question the culture, but they needed a very practical, economically oriented education. But if you were a free citizen of the Greek democracy or the Roman Republic, you had a different kind of education because you were the leaders of the of the country. I mean, in, in Greece, everybody gathered in the marketplace, or all the free citizens did, to debate every single issue. Shall we go to war or not? Well, the free citizens had to contribute to what their society was was going to do. Shall we raise taxes or not? Is this person guilty or innocent? And and there's a level of thinking that you had to do in order to have that democracy work. Same way in the Roman Republic. Um, if somebody was just a, a follower of whoever, you know, got them all riled up, and 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 didn't have an education that enabled them to have good judgment, again, it wasn't going to work. And so, a liberal education was a an education for freedom. It was an education for the leaders of the society. Okay, Again, they needed to know how to think at a very high level. They needed to, have, to know their heritage. They needed to know their laws. Uh, they needed to know the values and the great contributions of their society that they were to, to build on and pass on. And again, they were the ones who had to make the decisions. Whereas the slaves, 
you know, had, had, had nothing to say about it. And so this idea of a liberal education, an education to equip people for freedom and, and to be productive citizens and leaders, the people who are to get all the good ideas uh, to bring the country forward, that's what this tradition of a liberal education was about. Okay, uh, when the found, it's very interesting that the when the Protestant Reformation came, the big issue was teaching people how to read the Bible. I mean, most people couldn't even read; they had no education at all, really. And so, with the Protestant Reformation, wanted to put God's word in the hands of everyone, including you know the peasants who were kind of the slaves of that day, um, women. The, the, those early churches, the, the, the early Protestant churches opened schools for everybody to get everybody to learn how to read, including peasants, including women who, who were really cut out of things a lot. And it's interesting that they didn't just open Bible reading schools. They adopted the elements of liberal education and gave them an education really that would equip them, yes, to read the Bible, but also equip them for freedom. And with the Protestant Reformation, you started to have the social mobility. You know, the peasants didn't stay peasants very long once they uh, had a, a liberal education. And, uh, you know, they were opening businesses and leaving their, the, 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 the manners behind and, and becoming wealthy, and the nobles were borrowing money from them. And, again, an incredible social... Mobility that started with the Reformation and later, not too long later, much farther later, it started uh, with political freedom. And again, the freedom that we have as Americans, you read the founders, they talk about how if this experiment in a democratic republic is going to work, we have to have an educated populace. They didn't just stop there. They have to be educated with this kind of education, or it's not gonna not gonna work. Now, what is that specifically? Um, in in just about every college document that you have, uh, in the catalog and the student handbook and all these other things, at the very beginning, there's this uh, few pages that outlines our Christian philosophy of education. That's how it's titled. Please, each and every one of you, read it, and it will make sense of a lot of what you're going to be to be doing. And let me just briefly talk about some highlights. The f approach of a lib classical liberal arts—I mean, other colleges will say they're liberal arts colleges—and a lot of the terminology has is still there because. Colleges and universities were invented by Christians following this kind of approach, but they've sort of lost what it means. Um, just briefly, the liberal arts or a liberal education consists of the liberal arts and the liberal sciences. The arts are things that people can do. The sciences, the word science is just the Latin word for knowledge. These are the things that people can know. So knowing and you know, doing, being able to do things and knowing things, those are both part of, of a liberal education. Uh, the liberal arts are grammar, logic, rhetoric, the trivium, which aim at mastery of language. So being able to read really well, being able to write really well, being able to, to express yourself very effectively. Okay, that's a key part of, 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 of this education. Grammar, logic, rhetoric. Then there's the, that's the trivium, the three ways, and the quadrivium. The other four um, are uh, mathematics, um, geometry, music, uh, astronomy, and again, those aren't just subjects, they're philosophy of education. What they do is to address all of the human 
powers, the different kinds of learning, astronomy, that would be like scientific knowledge, empirical knowledge, applying mathematical models to facts, and again, physics and that you'll take, and biology kind of fit with that. Music, you know, say music and enjoy music, that brings the whole aesthetic realm into play to, to, to understand things that are beautiful and why they're beautiful, and how to make things of beauty. Uh, because mathematics is pure order. Um, geometry is spatial uh, knowledge. Anyway, all of these things are different ideas. And the, the, and the concept is the reason you're taking so many different things is to develop all of your God-given powers. Now, now, you'll have probably more God-given powers in one area than in another. But a liberal education is trying to build you up, like lifting weights makes you strong physically. The, the subjects you're going to be taking in the core make you strong mentally. Um, so we, we try to get at all of those uh, abilities. The sciences are a way to, to think there were three liberal sciences uh, natural science, which is knowledge of the objective world, not just nature, but other kinds of philosophical, metaphysical truths, knowledge of reality. That does include, you know, biology and physics and uh, what we would think of as science, but it also includes philosophy and, and other kinds of, of tr truth about the real world, the objective world. So there's natural science, there's moral science, which is knowledge about human beings, especially looking at, at the moral issues. History is considered a moral science because you're studying, you know, the record of the past, and you, but there's there, there's a moral. There's a lot of moral truth to be learned from history, both the great things that human beings have done and the bad things, the record of sin and the record of, of people you know, succeeding. So moral science included uh, you know, history, law, um, uh, what, what we call the humanities, the social sciences, political science. Those were all moral sciences about human nature, how people can live together, and, and so on. Uh, so there was natural science, objective world, moral science, knowledge of man, and th theological science, which is knowledge of God. Knowledge of God, knowledge of Scripture, knowledge of God's revelation, knowledge of theological truths. Um, you heard the old saying that theology used to be the queen of the sciences. Okay, that, that goes back to the, the classical uh, university model. And it's the queen, not because it, you know, limits or oppresses, you know, the others. A good queen doesn't do that. But, but God reigns over all of these. And all of the arts, grammar, logic, rhetoric, music, all the sciences, everything, went back to God, who's the final source and, 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 and sovereign over them all. So our core curriculum, the 63 credits, I don't know any school that has that big of a general education requirement. Um, it's the heart and soul of what we do. It's the basis for everything else. It isn't something to get out of the way. Okay, if I hear you saying that, I will jump on you and give you a whole lecture about whether you want to be a slave or whether you want to be free. And uh, Just don't say that around me. Uh, it's very annoying. It's the core. Now, the way our curriculum is structured, you have this incredible core curriculum where you're studying things just because they're, 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 they're worth studying. And, and I also don't want you to say... Uh, you know, well, I'm never going to use this. Why well, do I have to take Western civilization? I'm never going to use that. Western civilization uses you. Okay, that's not the point uh, that you say, and it, and it uses you to. But, but then, 
You do. Now, there are some schools that are liberal arts, and you'll get good education there, New St. Andrews and, and, and others. I salute them. They are pure. All they do for four years, there's no majors, you know, no professional focus at all, and I, I salute that. We, though, have that classical core, and then we do give you professional training, and those are your majors, the different tracks that you want to specialize in, because we do know you need to be prepared for for a profession, although we don't think of it as just an occupation or a job. It's not just job training that we're doing. We look at that as vocation. Vocation comes from a Latin word meaning calling. The Christian vocation. God's, that God has equipped you with certain talents and interests and abilities. And he's given you certain gifts and he's calling you to a certain area of service. Okay, it's a very different way of thinking even about you know your job. You know, well, what job makes makes the most money? I want to do that. Now, if God hasn't called you to that, you're going to crash and burn in, in, that, in, in pursuing it. And so, incredible core curriculum, then focusing on areas of your, of your calling. And then the apprenticeship component, where you're actually going out and practicing in the the world what things that you're going to be doing as part of your calling that that corresponds actually to the to the trivium in the liberal arts and by the way that was the way under the classical program people learned a profession if you wanted to be a lawyer or a doctor, or whatever, you would become an apprentice. You would actually go along with somebody who's actually in that field and learn how to do it with somebody actually uh, doing it. Uh, to this day, uh, doctors do their internships, and, 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 and we still see elements of that old method, and it works amazingly well. And we've come back to that. So kind of the grammar level, the basic facts, the basic uh, language, the basic knowledge of things, you, you know, you're getting that kind of in, in the core curriculum. You're learning, in, you're taking introductions, all kinds of things. On the logic level, you're um, learning to understand more deeply, and that kind of corresponds to your, your, your major courses. And then on the rhetoric level, where you have to creatively apply what you've learned that's what happens in the apprenticeship. And we found that this creates a very thorough, thorough education. Even in individual courses, you see that model of learning basic things. It's kind of like the grammar, but also understanding them. A lot of colleges stop at just learning them, take a multiple choice test and go on. Well, yeah, you do need to learn a lot of basic things. But you also need to understand them. That's the logic level. And the way you learn logic is through what's called dialectic, which means discussion. And in your classes, you're going to be doing a lot of discussion. And take part in that. Questions and answers. Uh, and, and getting into a dialogue. These are the ways that human beings are made to understand something thoroughly. And then the rhetoric in each class is where you apply it, where you come up with some of your own ideas, where you take what you've learned and you do something with it in a paper or a project or whatever. And again, this, this creates a thorough, thorough kind of learning of anything and everything. That's what you're going to have here. Well, my, my, time is, uh, my time is up. I mean, there are other elements of... Of, of a classical liberal arts approach. We're going to do a lot with uh, the great books. The great books. The great texts of our, of our civilization. You know, not just, just, just textbooks. But you're going to be reading the, the originals. You're going to be reading the great works and stimulated and taught by some of the greatest minds uh, 
I mean, yes, your, your professors are great minds, but you're also going to be learning from the great minds of the people who wrote those great books. People who've been dead sometimes for centuries, but still can teach you a lot. Um, again, standards are high here. Um, you'll work hard. Okay, everyone, everyone does. Um, you can, you can succeed here. Um, let me just add this. Uh, I read a, an article that found that the key to success in college is not high SAT scores, which is too bad for you because you tend to have high SAT scores. You know, even somebody who's really smart, has a lot of academic ability, may not do well. The, the key factors are willingness to work hard, but more importantly, love of learning. Someone who loves to learn, who's curious and finds things just interesting and loves to, to learn new things, those are the ones who tend to go the farthest, despite their IQ or anything else. Uh, sometimes we have people who have IQs and work hard, but they don't have the love of learning. But, but, but one of the things I hope that you cultivate, and you'll have a lot of help here uh, from your very good teachers on the faculty to your fellow students, people who have love of learning, it, it's infectious. And so I hope you cultivate that. You'll find kindred spirits. You may thought you're, you're the only person who cares about the things that you do. You'll find others that... that just like you, and they'll become probably lifelong friends. Um, and you'll be challenged. You'll grow spiritually. You'll grow intellectually. You'll grow in all of your talents. And this is an atmosphere that will support you and help make that happen. So, again, I welcome you to as part of this this enterprise that we're on. And uh, I know it will be a blessing for you. And when you really have the kind of lo love of learning that you'll get here, even the hard work becomes delightful, uh, believe, believe it or not. So, again, thank you. And, um, again, you'll, 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 you'll hear a lot about classical education. And uh, I urge you to read that, that statement that goes in a lot more detail than I had time to. So thank you, and I greet you on the beginning of a great career here. Thank you.